Take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2, if you would. And uh, glad to have the young people with us here today. Of course, uh, Brother Billy and Sherry Kirk were on the way up. They were already up there, actually, um, uh, on a planned visit uh, up to Ripley. And uh, so it's just opportune that they're there to be able to help and minister to the family. You'll also notice in your bulletin today that we have uh, the little gospel track that we told you about that we're putting together. Um, and this is, you'll see this, I just saw it on, the, on Facebook yesterday. Uh, this is going to be all over the place from now until the end of August. On August 21st, 2017, it's the first time in 38 years on the American and the 48 states that uh, any of the states have seen a total eclipse of the sun. And it's been, I think, a long, long time since it ever trans, uh, went right across from the Pacific to the Atlantic. So uh, the Great American Total Eclipse. And uh, what we've done in here is just to help people to understand what, what it is. You know, where we're, we're going to be right under it, by the way, here in Tennessee. Uh, but also it's basically uh, entitled Cosmic Coincidence or Divine Design. Um, from where we're standing on planet Earth. I love this little graphic here with the sun and the relative size of the Earth to the sun. And the moon, you can you need a magnifying glass to see the moon on there. It's 400 times smaller than the sun. But from where we are on planet Earth, the sun and the moon are exactly the same size. Now, why is that? Is that just an accident? Okay. Uh, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And so we've just used that little gospel presentation on the back there. But just help, the, help people to understand that the Bible is correct. And the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, he made two great lights. They're made at the same time. They're twins, except one's brighter than the other. A uh, greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. So um, we have quite a few of these. There's a box back there. We've got 3,000 of them. And we want you to have at least one today to take home and read for yourself. But take as many as you can. Everybody will be talking about this. And the stuff I've read on Facebook, um, they haven't even mentioned the, the whole idea of, you know, the this uh, cosmic coincidence or divine design. But to be able to use that as an, an icebreaker and an opener to show about creation and the existence of God and our responsibility to him. So anyway, hope you'll take a look at that today and take some and share them with others. Well, we're in Nehemiah chapter 2 this morning. And uh, the title of the lesson this morning is One Day in April. We're going to read the first eight verses of Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan... In the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been aforetime sad in his presence, wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city... The place of my father's sepulchres lath waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if, it, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may conv convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace. Uh, which uh, appertaineth to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of God upon me. Well, chapter 2 is Nehemiah continuing the story which began in chapter 1 uh, when he got news about what was going on in Jerusalem. Things were very dire. The walls were broken down. The gates were burned with fire. And it really, really uh, upset Nehemiah, and he gave himself to prayer. Now, he began praying, if you look at chapter 1 and verse 1, in the, the month Chislu, which is November, December time. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it came to pass in the month Nisan. 
in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. And this son, of course, is March, April time. And so this was a very special day because Nehemiah had been praying for four long months and he didn't know how or when the Lord would answer his prayer. He wasn't expecting it this particular day, but here it came four months later in the month of Nisan, one day in April, that he got the answer to his prayer. And so this is a very special day, this event that we're reading about in chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah got his prayer answered. To the Jews it was important in Jerusalem because they got a man who sought for their welfare. If you look over at uh, chapter 2, verse 10, the last part, the enemies of the Jews were upset. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man, that was Nehemiah, to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And really, Nehemiah would have been the answer, I'm sure, to many Jewish prayers of those in Judah and Jerusalem. So they got a man who sought for their welfare. To the city of Jerusalem, this was a special day because it would indeed be rebuilt. The walls would be rebuilt. The gates would be set in place. To the Messiah, this is an important day because the timing of his presenting to Israel is measured from this day. Now, this is what we're going to get into a little later on, uh, is the prophetic calendar given by Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. And then to Israel, uh, this is a special day because the timing of their kingdom is measured from this day. And of course, to the church, it's important because the church's existence would fit in, in between the break of the 69th and 70th week. And I'm sure some of you are saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, we'll get to that, hopefully, before we finish the lesson today. But just let's look at the passage. Uh, first of all, this one day in April began as a normal day. Uh, in verse number one, he says uh, that wine was before him, King Artaxerxes, and they took up the wine, gave it on to the king. And that's, of course, uh, what uh, Nehemiah's job was. He was the cupper, uh, chapter 1, verse 11, for I was the king's cupper. And so this was a normal day. Uh, he was at work as usual, didn't realize that this day would be a day that really would change history. And you know, you and I, when we get up in the morning, when we face that day, which might be a normal day, there might be things that take place in that day will, that will change history. You don't know what a day will bring forth. And so we need to be ready and really expectant that God could do wonderful things um, with a normal day. And then in verse number 1 and 2, we see that it began as a sad day. He said in verse 1, Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Now he was sad all the time, but when he came to work, he, he wasn't allowed to be sad. Uh, when you work for the king, uh, everything had to be right. Your attitude had to be right. Your demeanor had to be right. Your countenance had to be right. You weren't in there to tell sad stories and no, you were there to, to, to serve the king. And so he said, I had not been a four times sad in his presence. Verse 2, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad? In other words, he, he, let the, he let it slip. And somehow what was in his heart was coming out on his face. You have to watch that sometimes. A lot of times what happens in your heart comes out through your countenance and through your expressions. And we see now his emotions were beginning to show after these four months of great heaviness as he was concerned and mourning for the plight of his people in Jerusalem. And so this day of sadness surfaced this emotion. You know, sometimes uh, we have sad days too. As a, you, know, you know, sometimes believers think that, well, if you're a Christian, you're never to be sad. You're never to be sad. Well, that's not, that's not realistic, is it? Uh, there are sad days for you and for me. There are sad days that come to all of us. Jesus had sad days. Um, there are times of sadness. Uh, there's times of gladness as well, but there are times of the sad day. And we looked at that last time in Ecclesiastes. It's better to be in the house of mourning than to be um, in the house of mirth. And uh, there's sometimes God will do great and wonderful and important things during those times of sadness in our lives. So don't think that they're not of use. Sometimes God can do greater works in our hearts when our hearts are sad than, they, than he does when our hearts are happy. And so God is able to bring great good out of great sadness because, because he was sad and because it came through in the countenance, it really provoked the whole, the whole situation here where uh, Artaxerxes look at, looks at his sad face and he says, what's wrong with you? You're not sick. This is nothing other than sadness of heart. What's wrong with you? Tell me. And so he asked and Nehemiah told him. 
But then it was a fearful day in verse 3 because he says, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And then it says, Nehemiah, Nehemiah says, then I was very sore afraid. Now that's interesting, isn't it? He says, I was very sore afraid. He would have normally been afraid. But when you're in the king's presence and you're, you, you, you do something uh, that is negative that, and, and the king draws it to your attention, uh, that can be a very, very serious thing. In fact, really, uh, to be sad in the king's presence may have brought a death sentence for Nehemiah, so he was very sore afraid, and we probably would have been too. Um, and again, we mentioned this last time, it was kind of like Queen Esther, uh, you know, if I perish, I perish. She, she was not allowed to go into the king's presence without an invitation. And so she got herself all spruced up and she came into the king's court. Now, he could have just went like this off with her head, and that would have been the end of Esther. Uh, but he realized that she was there for an important reason, and so he took his scepter and he extended his scepter toward Esther, which means that she had grace. And so when she approached, he said, what do you need? What do you want? He says, I'll give you up to half of the kingdom. Now, that's a big deal, isn't it? Because he knew that what she was, she was putting her neck on the line for it. He knew that. And so uh, Artaxerxes knew this, and, and, and certainly Artaxerxes um, was concerned for Nehemiah. Um, but he, the Lord was in it, and the Lord just gave him grace uh, to you know, uh, find grace in his sight. So we have the benefit of the whole story here. I mean, we can say, well, we know what's going to happen. We know the end of the story. Everything works out well. But Nehemiah doesn't know that. You know, when he goes into chapter 2 here, it could have been that he was going to get his head cut off. And so he was sore afraid and we too will have times of fear in our lives but we must learn to trust in the lord when we are afraid that's what the psalmist said in psalm 56 verse 3 what time i am afraid i will trust in thee are you ever afraid i think we all experience that from time to time and so we must uh, put our trust in the lord the lord knows and the lord will make a way for us and then this was a day of opportunity, an opportune day. In verse 4 through 8, we see how the whole thing opens up now. So in verse 4, then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? <laughs> That's brilliant. Now here's the answer. This is the answer to his four months of praying. And what was the point of his prayer? Now he confessed and he fasted and he prayed day and night. But in chapter 1, verse 11, you will find he says, I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. That was the point of the prayer. Lord, give me mercy in the sight of this man. What man? Artaxerxes the king. Give me mercy in his sight. Because he knew he was a servant. He was a slave in a sense. And he couldn't just go and do whatever he wanted. It all hinged and depended upon the attitude of Artaxerxes. So he was praying that God would change the king's heart. And that uh, Nehemiah would have grace in his sight. And of course, that's what he says in verse number five. But so the king comes to him and he says, look, for what dost thou make request? He says, what do you want? And it's interesting in verse four, he says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. So he didn't say, now, he says, hold on a second. Dear Lord, what am I? You know, it's not going to be one of these long prayers. He's rarely had the long prayers, right? But when, when Artaxerxes in his presence says, what do you want? It's a very short and passionate and silent cry to God, Lord, help. <laughs> you know, help me now to say the right things. And I'm sure he thought about it over and over again. He prayed through it many, many times, but he didn't want to forget something. And so here goes, verse 5. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Artaxerxes didn't have to do this, but God opened his heart and gave him favor. And so here, Nehemiah's prayer is answered. If thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. He says, I want you to send me back uh, and command me to go back to build uh, the walls of Jerusalem. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? Now it ends up he's going to be gone for 12 years. You think your employer would let you go for 12 years? That's a long, long time. Um... And it's, you know, Nehemiah must have been a good guy because, you know, he wants, and he actually does go back again. Uh, and he works for our researches for more years after that. And then he returns to Jerusalem a second time. But, um, so it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. And then, of course, here's the things that he remembered that were important because it's not just a matter of getting time off work. 
He needed a command. He needed letters. He needed authority because there's enemies over here in Israel, people who don't like the Jews. Now, they're still under Persian rule, so uh, he has to, Nehemiah has to have the authority and the letters to go back to these people and say, I'm not just here doing my own thing. The king of Persia has sent me, and here's the letters, and here's the authority. And so this actually is a command of the Persian king for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And, of course, Nehemiah is the instrument in that. But that's very, very important because when we get to the prophecy here in just a minute, that's the whole idea. The whole idea is that there's a command that goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem. And this is the guy who makes the command. It's Artaxerxes. And he commands uh, Nehemiah to do it. And he writes letters of authority given to Nehemiah. And a, a whole band of soldiers goes with Nehemiah. And so he's coming with the king's authority. Verse 7, Moreover I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they make, uh, by the way, the river is the, you get the Tigris and the Euphrates. So everything on the western side of the Euphrates is beyond the river. Speaking about, of course, Israel. And uh, so that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he, now you see, Nehemiah just didn't just pop into his head. He had been praying about this for four months. He's thinking, now what do we need? We need timber. Uh, we need authority. We need uh uh, the, the tools and we need the men and we need the protection and we need the, uh, all the materials for rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the gates, uh, to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertaineth to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So it was an opportune day. It was a great oppor a day of opportunity. It's fantastic. This is, this is like fantastic. This is, this is beyond their way of the streams that they would not only be able to go back, but to go back with the authority of the king and the provision of the king. And so verse 8 helps us to understand this was really a very happy day. And you could just imagine all the burden and sadness of the previous four months just disappeared um, when the king basically was favorable to Nehemiah and gave him his request. It's a wonderful thing uh, when the Lord answers your prayers. It's a great thing when you get all that burden and the, the storms of life and all of a sudden the Lord just stands up and says, peace, be still, and it's, it's over with. And your prayer is answered and the burden has been lifted. And that's exactly how Nehemiah, Nehemiah felt this day. Now, in, in your notes now, <clears throat> number six, it's a prophetic day. And uh, so Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, we see that Ezra, who came back to build the people, that was uh, 13 years before, because it was in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Now we're in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the Persian king. So what we can actually do is you can look at this, um, you can look at this on a secular calendar, all right? Uh, the secularists, secular history historians know about Artaxerxes. They knew about Darius. They knew about Azarus. There's a whole history there. Um, uh, uh, of Mideast history uh, in the secular realm that they can look at and there's a calendar of dates that uh, pin these uh, Persian kings down and in the 20th year of Artaxerxes it is the year 445 BC and the month Nisan is March April time of 445 BC and of course what we're reading about in chapter 2 is the commandment to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem. All right, well, what's the big deal? What is so important about this day, this one day in April? Well, let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 uh, is one of the backbone prophecies that help us to understand really what the, Bible, the rest of the Bible talks about when it speaks about um, the rapture. The tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, the kingdom that, bring, that Jesus brings upon the earth. The other backbone prophecy is in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, the times of the Gentiles and how that there's a, the image, you know, the head of gold and all the way down to the, the feet with the uh, potter's clay and iron and the ten toes representing ten kings. And then a stone that is cut out without hands that comes from heaven, smashes the image upon its feet. Stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom on the earth. And that stone is speaking about Christ and his kingdom that fills the whole earth and doesn't coexist with Gentile kingdoms. You don't have Babylon 
and Media Persia and Greece and Rome and the final uh, manifestation of a Roman Empire in those ten confederation of ten kingdoms. Uh, the, the stone doesn't sit beside the image. It smashes the image, replaces the image, and the stone grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. So when Christ comes, it's going to be a political kingdom uh, that is a earthly kingdom. The, the Bible says that he shall rule and reign in Jerusalem upon the throne of his father David. And so there will be a kingdom on the earth. And so the wonderful thing about the Bible is not just what it has told you about what's, what has happened, but it tells you what's going to happen. And in Daniel chapter 9, we have a very, very important prophecy. Look at chapter 9 and verse 24 of Daniel. He says, by the way, and I don't, you know, I've got 15 minutes here to go through this. And, you know, it, it would take several hours to go through all the details. But if you read chapter 9 from the beginning, uh, Daniel realized that he had just lived through the 70 years of captivity, which God told him was going to be 70 years. And now the, now the question is, well, what now? What's going to happen to Jerusalem What's going to happen to the, the, you know, the Temple Mount? What's going to happen to the Jewish people? What's going to happen to the land of Israel? Uh, what does the future hold? He didn't know. Of course, Daniel would not get to go back, but he wanted to know what was going to happen for their future. And he prayed. And now the answer comes. In verse 24, the Bible says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So, the holy, so thy people is the Jewish people. The holy city is Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, and the word thee is, is definite, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Now, this is verse 24 is really, really important because what verse 24 is helping you to understand, it's going to give you a, a time frame, but verse 24 is telling you what this time frame accomplishes. So at the end of this period of time, uh, the, the great transgression is finished. The end of sins uh, has taken place. Well, I mean, when does the end of sins happen? All right. And to make reconciliation for iniquity, Israel and God will be reconciled. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, which is the temple, the holy place. So verse 24 is helping us to understand that the whole problem with Israel, they were in captivity. Sin had taken place. There was judgment of God upon them. And by the way, that's still true today. Just like they were banished from the land uh, in the Babylon for 70 years. They were scattered throughout the nations. Um, in 70 AD, uh, when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem, uh, for the last 2,000 years, Israel has been scattered. And only in the last you know, 100 years has Israel, the Jewish people, been coming back into the land and really since 1967 is when they controlled Jerusalem again. And now for the first time in two millennia, uh, they have their own flag, their own national identity, uh, their own army, their own language again, their own uh, 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 currency. All these things have taken place in our life. That's an amazing thing. Um, but what he's telling us here is at the end of this period of time, um, all of the sin is taken care of, the transgression is taken care of, reconciliation takes place, brings in everlasting righteousness. It's basically that the Messiah is going to come and that the kingdom will be established and everything that has been a problem between Israel and her God will be sorted out and they will be reconciled. And, and for in our understanding of the New Testament, Israel will receive Christ as their Messiah. They will have repented of the great sin of, of rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah. When Jesus Christ comes back and he will be their deliverer and their savior and he will establish a kingdom on the earth which will uh, be centered through uh, Jerusalem. So he says 70 weeks. Now the word weeks there, uh, it simply means sevens. And it could be seven days, seven hours, seven years. Um, of course, they've been used to understanding that the, the 70 years, the uh, was 490 years when they uh, didn't allow uh, the land to lie fallow. And God was counting them up. And so uh, seven, 40, uh, 490 years divided by seven gives you 70 years. So God took them out, got all the Sabbaths at once. When we study this, you're going to find out that the sevens are not seven days or seven months, but they're seven years, periods of seven years. 
Uh, so 70 times 7 years, which is 490 years, are determined upon thy people. So a period of time of 490 years are determined upon Israel. Well, when does it start? And this is the key thing for today. In verse number 25, he says, Know therefore and understand from the... Uh, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So you have the seven, a score is 20, so three scores is, is, uh, is 60, and two is 62, plus seven, 69. So there's 70 weeks, and he just talked about 69 of them, okay? And so 69 weeks until Messiah the Prince uh, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And of course, that's what Nehemiah is about. They build the wall even in troublous times. We'll see that when we get to chapter 2. Verse 26, And after three score and two weeks, that is the seven and the 62, so six, after 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now let's just stop there for a minute. What does it mean? First of all, it says, it gives you the time framing of the coming of the Messiah. He says, uh, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So 69 weeks and the Messiah will be here. Then after the Messiah comes, after uh, the 69th week, verse 26, after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. So here's when the Messiah is coming. And when he does come, he's going to die. He's going to be cut off. The word cut off means to be cut off violently. Uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, so he shall be cut off out of the land of the living. So the Messiah, when he comes, who will die, he will die a violent death to be cut off out of the land of the living. But then it goes on to say in verse 26, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. In other words, there was no reason in himself, there was no sin in the man himself that would bring on this violent death. In other words, he would die, but he would not die for himself. And of course, we understand that the Messiah did come. His name was Jesus, and he did die. And he didn't die for himself, but he died for us. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. So let's look at your little map on the back here. Um, the top map is, um, gives you more detail about the 70, the 70 weeks. And the bottom map basically puts those 70 weeks in, in the context of the whole program of God. If you look at the bottom map, map first, you'll see that little blue square at the bottom here that is broken. And that blue square, all of it represents 490 years. The first, the big block there is the 483 years, which is 69 weeks, okay? 483 years, and it's the exact time from 445 BC until 32 AD. You say, well, how, does, how does that work? That's 100, 476 years, okay? Um, and you have to, uh, if, if you notice the, the top map there, the, the, one of the blocks on the bottom there, seven weeks plus 62 weeks equals 69 weeks. And the 483 years, a 30-day Jewish calendar months. You understand that the Jewish calendar is different than the the Roman calendar, which which is what we're under, and that really the key uh, the key to, to understanding this is when you go to uh, the New Testament, and for example, uh, the Bible calls this seventieth week. This, so this last block here at the at, at the end is a period of one week or a period of seven years, and the Bible says, as you'll read here in a moment, that um, that the Antichrist breaks this promise in the middle of the week. So what's the middle of seven years? It's three and a half years. Three and a half years. It's also described in Revelation chapter 12 as a time, a times, and a dividing of a time. So it's three and a half years. But it also describes it, those three and a half years, as 42 months. Now, 42 months basically gives you, and those are 30-day months. Okay, so you're, you're on a lunar calendar. All right? So basically... Those, those years that he's speaking about is 360-day years. So you convert Jewish calendar years, 483 years, and Roman calendar years, 476 years, and uh, you come exactly from 445 B.C., the 32 A.D., you say, well, that's... Um, there's no year not, by the way. Okay, you go from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., okay? 
Um, so basically, it, it, the, the time frame fits the coming of Christ. So basically, when Jesus comes marching into Jerusalem, having ridden on the, on the little donkey on triumphal entry, coming to the eastern gate of Jerusalem, and he dismounts and he comes into the city, okay, he's coming in as the Messiah, the Prince, and that's exactly, when did that happen? When did Jesus die? He died on the feast of Passover. When does Passover happen? On the 14th of Nisan. Okay, one week before that, he's presenting himself again in the month of Nisan to the people of Israel as their Messiah. And so the Bible says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, which we've just been reading about in Nehemiah chapter 2, when our researchers told um, Nehemiah to go back and to build the city, to build the walls, unto Messiah the prince shall be three score, seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the, the walls shall be built again, uh, even in troublous times. And so that's when the Messiah came. You know, the Bible tells you in the Old Testament where he would come to, Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. In the Old Testament, it tells you how he would be born. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and birth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, it tells you where he'd be born. It tells you how he'd be born. It tells you out of what family he would come, the family of David. He would be the son of David. It tells you in Genesis 49 that he would come out of the tribe of Judah. But in Daniel chapter 9, it actually tells you when the Messiah would come. It tells you when it would come. Now, Daniel was written in Babylon or Persia in the east. Do you remember when Jesus was born? There was a, there was a sign in the sky. It was a star. And the wise men, the Magi, came from the east. And they said, they came, of course, they came to Jerusalem because they didn't know where. You see, the wise men didn't have Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But here's what I believe. I believe they did have the book of Daniel because that's where Daniel was. Daniel was a Magi. He was a wise man. He was from the east. And I believe they had the Daniel chapter 9 that gave them the timing of the Messiah, the King of Israel, who was coming. Therefore, they were looking for the sign of his coming, but they didn't know where to come to. So they came to Jerusalem. And so the Bible actually tells you when the Messiah would come. It also tells you, of course, verse 26, that when he would come, that he would be cut off, uh, but not for himself. Now, let's, in the last five minutes, look at the last part of verse 26 and verse 27, because this is where it gets interesting. It says, And the people of the prince that shall come. Now, who is the prince that shall come? Okay, that is speaking about the Antichrist that he speaks about in verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. So after the Messiah dies, the people are going to come and they're going to destroy the city. Now understand, this, this is written by Daniel. This is five, over 500 years BC. And he's just describing for you what happens with the Romans in 70 AD uh, under the Roman emperor Vespian and his general Titus who come in uh, to quell the revolt of the Jews um, in 70 AD. That's when Masada was taken, I think two years after that, 72 AD. Um, but they will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the, the, the temple of Herod, the temple of Jesus' time, was destroyed in 70 AD. That's a long time ago. And then it was, uh, I think it was in the 600s AD when the Muslims came and built the uh, when you look at the Jerusalem, you see the golden dome. That's the dome of the rock. That's a shrine uh, where the temple would have sat. And, be, and basically the reason they put it there was so that the Jews couldn't put the temple back there again. But it will be coming back again. Um, but uh, it says, The prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. They're going to destroy the temple. By the way, Jesus prophesied that. Um, 40 years before it happened. You know, Jesus died in 32. Uh, the temple wasn't destroyed until 70 AD. But in his ministry, just before he was crucified, he told them, he says, when they, in Matthew 24, they brought him out to show him the buildings of the temple. And he said, do you see these buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. And that's what happened uh, when the Romans invaded Jerusalem and they tore the temple down block by block. They said in the, in the Herod's buildings were so ornate, they had gold in the, in the ceiling of that temple. And when they burned it with fire, the gold literally ran down between the blocks. 
and they took the blocks apart to get out the gold and the seams. But uh, and beside that, they just literally wanted the, the whole uh, Jewish worship system to be de demolished. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today, where the Wailing Wall is, which is the Western Wall, if the Wailing Wall is here and you're looking north, and this is the, the Southern Wall, where the steps are and the entrance into the temple over here, this is the Wailing Wall here. And uh, the Wailing Wall is on the, the northern side of that, the Western Plaza. But, uh, and there's a wooden ramp that goes up here. When you're standing on this side, there's a pavement that you can see where they have dug it all up. And you can see where the blocks were taken off the, the, the temple mount on the temple. And they were thrown over. And they fell down and they crushed the pavement. And the, those blocks are still there. You can still see the, 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 the pavement crushed and, and broken and ca uh, caved in. You can still see it there today where the Roman army threw the temple off and they, they demolished it block by block. And some of those blocks weighed, you know, uh, tons and tons. It's an, an amazing thing that you can go and actually see that today. And he, he tells you that in verse 26, that the, uh, they, they will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, <clears throat> here's the problem. The problem is that um, the, the temple was destroyed um, 40 years after Jesus died. Verse 26, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Well, how is that? If, if the 490 years run consecutively, then seven years after Jesus' death, the kingdom would have been here, the end of transgression, the end of sins, everything would have been fulfilled. Seven years after Jesus had been crucified, right? If all the 490 years ran consecutively. But what we find is, is that after the 69th year, after they, they crucified the Messiah, after they killed him, the Bible teaches us that the calendar was stopped. God paused the 490 years after the 483rd year. Why? Because what he's telling you in verse 26 about the sanctuary being destroyed happened 30 years Sorry, 40 years after the death of the Messiah. So that been, you know, that's you know, that's way beyond the end of the of the calendar. Something happened. The the pendulum on God's time clock stopped, and there was a pause. And that's why, if you go to verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Who's the he? It's the prince that shall come. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the missing week. That's the 70th week. That's the last week. And in the middle of the week, three and a half years in, he shall cause the sacrifice and the ablation to cease. And so what you're looking at on your map here, this little colored map, is that when they rejected Christ as their Messiah, God rejected them. Not forever. Blindness and part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. But God basically reached across to the pendulum and stopped it. He put the calendar on hold. And in between that, there's been 2,000 years when that calendar's been on hold. And that's where God has done something completely new and different. The mystery, uh, Paul talked about the church age in which we live right now. And... Um, one day the Lord will come back for his church and we'll be taken out. Uh, that's called the rapture, uh, the season away of his bride. What will happen then? Uh, well, once the church is taken out, you see the church in red there, and the rapture takes place, then he goes back to this last little blue bit. This last week of Daniel's prophecy must be fulfilled. And it will be fulfilled literally, just as the first uh, 69 weeks were fulfilled literally. And so that's why we understand that the tribulation period is, three and a, is, is seven years in length. Because when you dovetail this prophecy with what you find in the, the book of the Revelation, especially chapter 12, where he mentions three and a half years, time times and the dividing of time, um, uh, 1260 days and 42 months, it's 30 day months, three and a half years. And so three and a half years after the tribulation begins, and it begins with a covenant, a peace treaty between the Antichrist, uh, the ruler of a revived Roman Empire, and uh, makes a peace treaty with a covenant with Israel, and they are allowed to sacrifice on the Temple Mount. And what happens three and a half years in, it says he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, the Antichrist turns on Israel. In the last three and a half years that Jesus speaks about Matthew 24 is great tribulation, great persecution from the Antichrist 
uh, on the Jewish people. At the end of that period of time, at the end of that 70th week, is when everything ends. Uh, it finishes the transgression. It's the end of sins. It brings in everlasting righteousness. It's when the Messiah comes back again. And the promise made to Daniel is ultimately fulfilled. And so we have a calendar of events that God has given to us that helps us to understand not only what has happened, but what will happen in the future of Israel. And when does the calendar start? One day in April. Nehemiah chapter 2. When Artaxerxes gives a command for Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Very, very interesting. Now, there's a lot on that sheet. I hope that you'll take it home and look up the verses and look at the top chart and uh, read through that. And I hope you understand what these things are saying because they're very, very important. And by the way, if you don't understand, I would love to hear your question. Sometimes, I know there's some of this little technical little detail, um, but if you don't understand this or there's questions, well, why, why is that? Or I don't see how that and that fits together. Then ask the question, okay? I'd be very happy to talk to you after the service and if we get some of those questions we can uh, maybe do a lesson trying to answer some of those questions for you but it fits together and at the end of that period of time uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and he is going to bring in everlasting righteousness and all the promises made to Israel and to the world will be fulfilled in him but isn't that an amazing thing that God gives you a time frame when the Messiah would come. He tells you when he would come, that he would be cut off, that he would die, but not for himself. He also gives you a gap between when that event happens and the last, the last period of seven years. And the Bible goes on to talk about that period of seven years and the reign of the Antichrist and the relationship with Israel. By the way, there has to be a temple in Jerusalem by the middle of the tribulation. There has to be, there has to be a place that he defiles uh, the Holy of Holies, there has to be a sacrificial system in place because he stops it. Is there one there right now? No. Are they talking about it? Yeah. Uh, the Temple Mount, and that's that brings a whole other subject on. Well, what about Islam? What about the Dome of the Rock? How can Israel put a temple on the Temple Mount when the, 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 the shrine of the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque are there? And, uh, you know, every, every couple of weeks or months on the television you're going to have problems on the temple mount and there's rats and all all this tension that's going on who owns it well israel own it uh but the jordanians uh basically control what goes on up there and that's why many of the jewish people are not allowed to go up there but there's a lot of tension there but that's going to change and i think that's where ezekiel 38 comes in anyway um i hope that wasn't too <laughs> too difficult for you uh, but Nehemiah chapter 2, very, very important day, one day in April, because that was the day that began the whole ball rolling. That was the thing that started this calendar of events uh, that affected the coming of Christ the first time and really the coming of Christ the second time as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your precious word, for the promises we find in it. We're grateful, Lord, for the fact that you love us, that you love the world, that you gave your only begotten Son. And Lord, in this time when the gospel goes forth, Help us to realize that it's a window of opportunity uh, that one day will close. One day you're coming for us and then again you will turn your attention to Israel to work repentance in that nation and that one day they will lift up their heads for the redemption draws nigh and they shall indeed say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, we look for those days and we look for you to come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.